So I'm starting when I originally should finish, but I try to hurry through. Uh, thank you, Manuel. Uh, let me start with a personal comment. Uh, we have very ambitious aims at this conference, and long-term predictions, this is my experience in forensic sciences, are generally very risky. But I have some optimism regarding the aims of this conference, and this is based on some experience. In 1989, I worked on the Violence Commission of the German government, and in 2012 on Chancellor Merkel's expert group on crime policy. And when I compare what we did in the late 80s and what we did now, I can see there's a clear, clear progress. We have much better knowledge, and we have better programs out of violence prevention. However, what is also obvious in my view is there is not enough integration of different approaches, and sometimes there's too much polarization between primary prevention and later criminal justice measures, also police measures. It's a very similar uh, polarization. I work in both areas, therefore I feel I'm not prejudiced. I can look in a fair way on both approaches. We must also be aware, and some of the leaders in this field are here, violence went down in many countries. There is a crime drop. We have had very high incarceration rates in some countries. America is the leaders. Russia also was high. And we realize now there is a decrease. I don't show any figures. I have them, but uh, time is running out. We have no simple explanations for these developments, these positive developments. Numerous factors may play a role, age structure of populations, economy, education, poly public opinion changes, nutrition may play a role, birth rates in deprived groups, health care, family and youth services, and of course also our many prevention programs. However, we have differences between otherwise similar countries, even in Scandinavia and some of these countries, and also in the United States, crime went down in states where reduced incarceration happened. But it also went down in states where they went on with the typical incarceration policy. There also may be some artifacts, for instance, moving <laughs> prisoners from state prisons to local jails where there are yeah, less services. So we have not so easy to interpret data. Most lectures, particularly yesterday here, gave good examples of early prevention with a focus on children, women, and families. However, we must be aware, and I have seen and have run a number of studies by myself, even successful primary and secondary prevention programs rarely show big bang effects. We have significant differences, but this is not often a real great drop. It's medium to small effect sizes. Even programs, David Olds, Nurse, Family Partnerships, it's a positive long-term effect, but a modest effect overall. In addition, many groups at risk for violence are not yet reached by these programs. And we have only few evidence-based measures in many countries in Africa, Latin America, parts of Asia, and also parts of Europe. We should not overemphasize how well we do in Europe. This should and can be changed, and this is why we are here. But even the best prevention will leave us with many violent offenders. They will not die out over the next 100 years. A large proportion of violence, and we must also be aware of that, involves young men, young perpetrators and victims, and not within the family or school context, but out on the streets and so on. And also serious and persistent violent offenders are responsible for a large part of other crimes as well. So the focus on violence is sometimes a little too narrow. We must also take other serious harming crimes into account. For such reasons, and I'm not a lawyer, I'm originally a psychologist and a hobby criminologist, uh, for such reasons the criminal justice system plays an important role in dealing with violence. Setting and reinforcing norms, victim protection, particularly important reducing re-offending, and successful criminal justice interventions can decrease the prevalence of violence. This is tertiary prevention in our traditional terminology. And this can also function as primary prevention because they often become fathers and they have children. And if they don't residuate, they can really improve the lives of their family and their offspring. But criminal justice measures are often seen as 
punishment only, and sometimes the social workers stigmatize the, these uh, approaches. However, we must be aware the aims of the criminal law are mixed, compensation of guilt, this is why we punish them, protection of the general public, general and specific deterrence, retribution, Larry mentioned this, and rehabilitation. And it depends, and I fully agree with you, it depends on leadership in a country, what aims are most strongly emphasized to keep a balance between these different aims of the criminal justice system. It's only one part, I don't go through this, but we must be aware we have so many different levels of violence prevention that, as it was mentioned by Larry before, every part plays only one more or less minor or important role. Preschool and so on. I don't go through. Here we have justice, criminal justice, evidence-based sanctions, correctional treatment, restriction of access to firearms, and many other measures that are important in this field. My focus is now on what works, on this rehabilitation. They have already done violence. And we had a first phase in the what works uh, approach in which we disproved the nothing works doctrine. The nothing works doctrine was prevalent in the 70s and in early 80s. Then in my view, we had a second phase, a transfer from research into practice, development and large scale implementation of evidence oriented rehabilitation programs, accreditation of programs, quality insurance. What we need now, and we are on this path, we need a third phase in my view, differentiation and international transfer. This just started, I will talk about this later on. First, what does the What Works literature show? These are all meta-analyses, so it's not single studies, they include hundreds, more than 600 studies are included, and what you see clearly see here, this would be a zero effect. All effects on average are positive, and they are also positive for young offenders what is also interesting, they are relatively similar, as you can see here. And this would be, it is always difficult to have a channel effect size, but here we would have a 20% reduction of reoffending, of violent reoffending, of serious reoffending, uh, if the base rate in the control group is 50%. What can we conclude from that? The percentage reduction of recidivism depends on the base rate, of course. This is why homicide is not always an ideal measure in this field, because we have a very low base rate. The typical effect sizes, mean effect sizes of all these studies and programs is a reduction of reoffending between 5 and 25 percent. There are a number of studies out showing that this effect size pays off in financial terms as well, not only victim uh, uh, protection, but also there is a payoff with regard to the invested money. The lifetime cost for one serious persistent violent offenders, this is not known in the general public, can be between, or often are between one and five million US dollars or, or pounds or whatever currency you have. The pound is thanks to Scotland now, uh, still stable. I was anxious that I will lose money because money exchange rate to Germany is a problem for me. And we should also be aware uh, that the typical effect sizes we are, just have seen are very similar to well-accepted treatments in the medical field. For instance, radiation and chemotherapy of brain tumors, approximately 10% less mortality rates. This is not a bigger effect of what we have in offender treatment or aspirin therapy of cardiovascular events, 30% reduction. It's a little different in the field of sexual offending. Here are again meta-analysis on sex offender treatment worldwide but mostly from North America. And you see the effects are more heterogeneous. Here, oh, take that one. Very small effect, relatively large effect. Why? We have smaller samples and we have also a lot of not so good studies and they may contribute to these large differences. This is why recently we carried out uh, updated meta-analysis only sound quality studies, level three of the Maryland scale, so we can assume equivalence between treatment and control groups. 28 studies fulfilled these criteria, treatment and control group, more than 8,000 offenders involved, mainly now because people have learned what to do, mainly cognitive behavioral programs, and here you see the results. We can see here the 
Reoffending rates in sexual offenders in sex offenses are low, in particular the official rates, we see 12.4 to 9%. This is a 27% reduction and also in other offenses we have a positive effect. Now, in a nutshell, what do we know what types of programs are doing relatively well and what types of programs are not working as we want them to work? Larry mentioned already cognitive behavioral treatment, not only by the police, sometimes they should be more experienced in this field. Most important elements of CPT for violent offenders, this is shown by a number of studies, is anger management, interpersonal problem solving, and social skills training. What also seems to work in a number of studies, structured therapeutic communities, milieu and social therapy, and also for young violent offenders, multisystemic therapy and functional family therapy. Where do we have replicated, but not so much replicated effect as with CPT, basic education, vocational training, if it is useful for these people who can train somebody and later on he gets unemployed, then it does not help very much, restorative justice, not for all groups, drug courts if there is a treatment element, and pharmacological substitution drug treatment for some groups. We must differentiate. Less replicated, weaker studies, and or very small effects, traditional counseling, eclectic and psychodynamic approaches, community service work, or work, community work, mentoring program, sports programs. Many people say, let's do them sports program, then they will not reoffend violently, they're acting out there. Unfortunately, the evidence is yet weak. Not many good studies out in the literature or in the field. Adventure challenge programs, small effects, very similar problems as with sports programs. More sound studies needed, prison work, community deployment programs, electronic monitoring, smart punishment and supervision. Here we have the problem of violation of orders, as it is the case in intensive supervision, and revocation is seen as a failure. Pharmacological treatment for specific subgroups of sexual offenders, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and antiandrogenes. Zero or potential negative effects, mere I emphasize mere sanctions because many treatment approaches, of course, in criminal justice are always linked to some kind of sanctions. They are not isolated, so this is not an alternative punishment versus treatment. It is involved in sanctions. Also, longer versus short imprisonment, purely deterrent measures, like these famous cat straight programs for young violent offenders, put them for a short time into prison for very serious violent offenders, and then they may be deterred. This was the hypothesis. The result was, as many of you may know, the contrary. They were attracted by these tough guys, these violent and, and very tough men in the prison. The first generation of boot camps, strict discipline without treatment components, also did not work, but they were widespread in the United States for many years and still going on also in some parts of Europe. The evidence is clearly showing. Now it goes down. This is good. Uh, one of our students has written about that here. Now we move on from specific programs to broader concept of uh, successful interventions. And one of the most important models is the risk, need, responsibility model. You must design your intervention according to the risk principle. That means for serious high-risk offenders, you need intensive programs. The need principle addresses specific criminogenic needs and not only doing non-directive therapy because you were once trained in this area when you were young. You must focus on the problems of these people. Responsivity principle, that means adequate programs with regard to the specific learning modes of these offenders. And these types of programs can reduce approximately 30% of recidivism of violent and other serious offenders. And what is very interesting, some meta-analysts looked to a broad range of programs and whether they have really realized these three principles or not. And what you see here is relatively strong effects when they have realized it, even a slight negative effect here when they did something in the best motivation, but not in an adequate manner. And the effect sizes go down the less principles you realize. Sexual offender treatment, a very similar picture. It depends what kind of program and how it really fulfills the criteria of R&R. A most recent systematic uh, study, meta-analysis, 
on young serious offender programs, uh, for, uh, programs for young serious offenders in Europe, done by our group, and you see the same pattern again. And you clearly see action and goodwill is not enough. Programs can harm. We have a slight negative effect of those programs that did not meet this criteria. This kind of research accumulated over the last 20 years let now do the transfer into practice. I briefly address uh, United Kingdom uh, and England and Wales in particular. We develop now specific criteria what programs should contain to be successful. A clear model of change, adequate selection of offenders, targeting a range of dynamic, that means changeable risk factors. You cannot change when the father was a criminal 20 years ago. It must be something you can do now. An adequate sequencing, intensity and duration. I don't go through in detail for reasons of time. Particularly important also number nine, integrity. Selection, training and supervision of stuff. And here it comes again back to your argument. Leadership is important. What they are really try to do with their stuff and in a local or in another prison. The story is unfortunately not so nice with regard to all programs. We have now in this country 40 or so aggregated programs for violent, sexual and other offenders. There was a fast widespread rollout. Unfortunately, we have too few well-controlled evaluations, not always positive effects, so some findings are mixed. A recent very large evaluation, not an RCT because it's very difficult, in particular afterwards, to do an uh, RCT. This country should do more RCTs than other countries, but we cannot always do them. So these were participants of the Enhanced Thinking Skills, a classical cognitive behavioral program, and they were compared with a large cohort of offenders matched for risk and sentence length. The effects, 12.6 reduction, in reoffending rates, and the more sensitive measure is number of reoffenses, 19%. So this is not too bad. The most recent finding is also interesting because it, it fits to one hypothesis I had already in the 80s that there's an inverse U shape relationship between risk level of reoffending and effect size. And you can see here, indeed, it is a case, oh, grass is the uh, score we have in this country for the risk level of offending, risk of reoffending. A number of indicators are uh, contained in this, in this uh, measure. And you see higher risk levels, lower effects, very high, and very low risk levels. This is the base rate is very low, also low effects. The strongest effect is the middle to upper area. And what is particularly important finding, all offense type, including the many aggressive offenders, the effect sizes are lower than in non-aggressive, and this means mainly violent offenses. Here is the mean for the violent offenses, 31% less reoffending. This is not bad. Of course, this study has flaws. It's not a randomized trial. It's a measure of predicted reoffending. We also have some macro level data on that. In UK, where leaders really, and surprisingly not only the Labour government, but also later on the Conservative Liberal government, still emphasize rehabilitation. Now, with an emphasis on payment for results, this is a little strange, but still there was not a change because the leaders showed some continuity of emphasizing these goals and aims. Release from custody, approximately 46% uh, reoffended compared to 2,000, 5% less. This is not huge, but when we look at the numbers of offenses, it's more than 10% less. And interestingly, the reoffense rate are lowest for those who are one to four years in prison. And this is the tar main target groups of our programs. Community orders, similar picture, 9.8% less than in 2,000, and 17% less offenses, re-offenses. So, Something seems to work, also it's not, of course, the best quality of studies. However, we have a lot of heterogeneity in findings. This is a, a study we put together only good quality, cognitive behavioral treatment, this was at this time the state of the art, of sexual offender treatment. And here you see, on the right side, positive effects, on the left side, negative, and here zero. So what do we see? Some of these programs, they are all very similar, have rather good effects, 
Some have no effect and a few have even a slightly negative, so the control group did better. We shouldn't have implemented this treatment for them. And we have many of these moderators in our field. We must be aware of that. The gold standard program is not the only story. It's a very complex picture. This is from our own recent uh, 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 meta-analysis on young serious offenders. And you see treatment, oh here we are, treatment mode is important, fidelity of implementation, community versus custody, Motivation, so whether they are enforced to participate or not, seems not to play such an important role. We know that from drug offender treatment for many years. Sample size is important, and this is the same in all prevention experiments. It's a, it's a very common finding. Large studies have smaller effects. This is not good news for policymaking, because in policymaking we want to roll out widespread. What could be the reason? It can have to do with publication bias. But it can also be due to deficits in implementation, in treatment integrity. We, when you have, we have experiences already in the Head Start program in the 70s in the United States, a large rollout, the programs deteriorated. This is why I think we must take into account many factors that contribute to effectiveness of programs. I don't walk through the whole graph. I put together what seems to come out from research and practical experience. Of course, a program, type of program, quality of delivery, intensity, content of control condition. It's also important. If the control condition is in very lousy conditions, in very bad prisons, you get a better effect in the treatment uh, uh, program. Treatment context, custody community, staff competence and motivation, A mentioned, I don't go through. Offender factors, unfortunately, here we have less knowledge than in the other areas. The only very clear knowledge is high risk and medium risk offenders, better effect sizes. This has to do with the base rates. Also, still difficulties with treating personality disordered and psychopathic offenders. They react, but it's not hopeless. We have done some work in this country and also in other countries. There are now promising approaches to these difficult offenders. Evaluation methods, in many systematic reviews, they explain the largest amount of, amount of variance. This shows it depends very much also what kind of studies we are carrying out. Sample size I mentioned, whether it's practice versus demonstration, independent evaluation of smaller effects, and so on. So this is, uh, in my view, the state of the art from those countries where we have some sound research. Now we need to move forward to this third phase. And we must take into account these many different factors. And we need the third phase that investigates this complexity of influences and translates into worldwide practice. Number one, we need more transnational approaches to offender treatment. Most of the literature comes from North America and the English-speaking world. But even in Europe, we have recently completed a project strengthening transnational approaches to reducing reoffending in the European Union on young offender treatment, drug addicted offenders, and domestic violent perpetrators. Most of the 27 countries we investigated had no systematic evaluation at all. So the blind spots are not only in Africa, they are also in parts of, 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 of this continent. They see, of course, the situation is even worse in other parts, in the low income parts of the world. Programs cannot simply be implemented across different countries. There are cultural, legal, economic, other differences that play a role. What you need is now international strategies and guidelines. To I mean, we are currently working in one project on that to support local program development, adaptation of programs, implementation, and systematic low-cost evaluations. A former student who works in Ghana, he has not the money to do randomized control trials, but he may be able to do at least some systematic evaluation, tracking what Larry mentioned, what has been done and what the outcomes are. We have some promising initiatives with respect, and our applied criminology program that Larry mentioned here contributes to this, promotes leadership. Unfortunately, Many of our international students don't go back to their countries. They stay in this country and improve perhaps the situation in, in England. I would like to have them more frequently going back to Latin America and so on. More systems orientation instead of silo approaches. It's very similar in developmental prevention. 
Many of our people have accumulated risk factors from experience of abuse, impulsivity, personality disorders, and so on and so on. We need more systematic knowledge about the impact of patterns, not an isolated program, but patterns or combinations of interventions. The situation and the challenge is very similar to what we know from clinical pharmacology. They invented this discipline in medicine because they realized many people get a number of different drugs, particularly when they get older. So what is the combination of these measures? These combinations are more difficult to evaluate. You cannot simply do a randomized control trial. You must disentangle the elements of this treatment. And only one example, this is a concept of the of international management service in this country. And you see there are a number of pathways where we know they contribute to reoffending. And depending on the pattern of problems of an offender, we should target these pathways. More integration of natural protective factors. We have now better knowledge on desistance and why desistance happens. Family, work, relations play a role. And we need to integrate these findings into our treatment approaches. We should make more use of resilience research. This is another area of my interest over many years. For instance, social bonding, social support, self-efficacy, and so on. Such resources can particularly be helpful in low-income countries because we often have these relations there. We often have not so good prisons and programs, but we have some of these resources. This is a recent finding of our study here on resettlement. We investigated prisoners before release and after release, and not only the prisoner, but also a female partner and the children. And what we found is that good family relation and contact, intensive contact during imprisonment were key factors for coping with resettlement problems. What is also interesting, the women were more realistic than the offenders. So it involves the woman in planning, though you get perhaps a better realistic perspective. More differentiation. Many programs are still of the character of one size fits all. We have in our review on, on, on sex offender treatment, the clear finding that if it is a group only, a standardized training, the effects are no, zero here. It's better when you have more individualized approaches. So conserve the strengths of structured group programs, but include flexibility for specific groups. I think we have important target groups, young adult offenders, because they are the future, also for the children, sexual offenders, personality disorder offenders, because they are very often repeat violent offenders, domestic violent perpetrators. We have no good research worldwide in this field. Various minorities have specific problems. And also female offenders. It's a small group only, but they also are the mothers of the children, and they may be able to promote a better uh, environment for their children. And we should focus on medium to high risk cases, not the absolutely highest, psychopaths, but also not low risk, because these people develop well without interventions. More emphasis on interpersonal relationships. Uh, I skip this slide. What is found is where there are good staff competencies, again related to leadership, and the treatment outcome is better in this field. Again, this is an inexpensive resource that can be particularly useful in low-income countries when we train them and we show them how to interact in a more fair and polite way with offenders. Improving institutional context. This work is widely isolated from the literature on treatment programs, but we know all the negative aspects of incarceration, contagion, subcultures, and so on, crowding, and they may hinder successful interventions. This is why we need to put a clearer focus on regime dimensions, on situational factors, and there are clear differences between institutions. In a number of countries, this has been shown. We have correlations with suicide rates, infractions, but we have less knowledge yet on the relation to recidivism. So the improvement of organizational factors, again, related to leadership, role of a prison governor and leadership in the ministries, is particularly needed in many low and middle income countries with problems of legitimacy, not all, also in now relatively rich countries like Turkey, where we have prisons that are not nice places for many of the inmates. Of course, never a prison is a nice place, but there are differences. We have promising activities in this respect in Africa, Latin America, and so on. 
integration of neurobiology. David Finkelroy yesterday mentioned this already with regard to early prevention programs. We made progress in this area of research with regard to antisocial personality disorder and so on. <laughs> what is a clear finding is that the connectivity deficits between subcortical and cortical regions, emotional input, decision making are important and there may be problems. We have positive effects of a number of more pharmacological and biological interventions, but we need better studies in this field, no doubt. Nutrition can be also healthy, according to some studies in, in, in prisons, an adequate diet. So medication is controversial. And it should only be implemented for subgroups where this is a promising and also, of course, in an informed consent mode. But we should not hesitate to learn from depression treatment, where medication plus combinations plus, uh, plus uh, cognitive behavioral treatment is often the best way to intervene. More process and outcome evaluation. Most evaluations do not report details on that. What is an optimal degree of manualization? The sequence of programs is highly important, but we don't know much. We must improve our knowledge. Descriptive validity, a term we created in the 80s, showed this is the quality of description, showed a strong relation to effectiveness in our system, older systematic review. No, it's just not old, it's just rather new, yeah, uh, of sex offender treatment. So we need now to implement more. What we know from implementation science is exactly the same as in developmental prevention, staff training, supervision, assessment, and support. Also more well-controlled, long-term and independent outcome evaluations with hard outcome criteria. Comparisons of programs, as stepwise capacity building, again, in low-income countries. More community programs, because the Nagin and others have shown that incarceration does not have, at least not always have, the uh, uh, deterrent effect. In Portugal, often it has a negative effect. We cannot avoid incarceration because compensation for guilt requires incarceration in many uh, legal uh, contexts. But the effects of incarceration, treatment in custody, are not zero. And they vary between different offender groups. In a recent study uh, with Johann Köhler, we not yet published, we find that for drug addicted offenders, incarceration may be better than for other kinds of offenders, so they get some kind of protection. We need more direct comparisons if possible. And finally, more integration of early prevention and correctional treatment. We had a discussion on that yesterday in the morning. In my experience, in my view, basic concepts, strategies, and problems are often very similar in both areas. We have too much separation related to healthcare, education, and they're somewhere outside the criminal justice system, but not well known. We should make more use of a truly developmental perspective. It's never too early and never too late to intervene, and many people will climb up this ladder and will end up as violent offenders, and then we need adequate rehabilitation. This is a graph very similar, I don't go through, I developed some time ago for developmental prevention. And the findings you may see only in the glance are very similar to what we found with regard to the complexity of offender treatment. So conclusion, there is a clear progress in offender rehabilitation in my view and the view of others over the last decades. Also many problems remain. This third phase of what works is needed in research and practice. This involves more differentiation, sound implementation, outcome evaluation, and capacity building in low- and middle-income countries. In my view, what research in both fields tells us is too much optimism is not helpful. In offender treatment, it's the same in, 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 in development prevention, but too much pessimism is a real problem. These are basic concepts. Some of you may know, because they know I'm coming from Nuremberg originally in Germany. This is one basic concept. I call it the Nuremberg funnel model. And you see here the person who has deficit. Let's say the violent offender. And here we have the magistrates. And here is a liquid. And they pour it in a funnel directly into his brain. This was invented in the 18th century. Unfortunately, the instrument got lost. So we can no longer use it. And the saying was, it's safe and quick in making heads bright. This is what our finance ministers want to have. 
And this is what some of our program developers say. My program makes it quick and safe. Then we have the more cynical model. Nothing works despite many efforts. I call it the Sisyphus model. Rolling up the stone, working with these offenders, and at the end they come again into our prisons. And finally, we have a model I would call it Baron Münchhausen, as a German story. He, as you see, he was in a swamp uh, here, and by his hair, he draws himself out with the help of a good horse out of the swamp. The good horse may be good police, may be good treatment, may be a good criminal justice system. So the reality, I think, and I hope I have convinced you, is somewhere in between these three concepts. And now I wish you, uh, yes. I finished. Thanks. <laughs>